I'm, uh, I'm going to call that time to get started. So welcome everyone to today's webinar on the basics of a bill. My name is Michelle Hewitt and I'm co-chair of Disability Without Poverty and I'll be your host for today's event. Before we begin the webinar, I'm going to go over our accessibility components and agenda for today. Please note that throughout the event, we will have the chat closed to the public as it can be destructive to other participants. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, you will be able to send a chat message to the hosts and panelists. For all your questions that you have, please put those in the Q&A box, usually at the bottom of your screen. Our meeting today features simultaneous English and French translation, LSQ and ASL interpretation, English and French captioning. Please take a moment to adjust your settings as appropriate. First, please select your preferred language, English or French. You do this by selecting the interpretation option on your Zoom menu. Once you select this option, you will not need to change language settings again during the presentation. You must select a language, even if you want to hear the presentation in English. If you're using a mobile device, such as a tablet or a phone, you can find the language interpretation options under more. For those who require ASL or LSQ interpretation, we will be spotlighting those components throughout the presentation. No need to do anything. These will automatically remain on your screen. To enable captions, please select the captions option on your Zoom menu. If you would like to adjust the size and placement of these captions, you will need to go into your Zoom accessibility settings. If we can support you through this presentation, please send us a message in the chat box and somebody will assist you. So to summarize our accessibility options, please select your language using the interpretation option, enable captions if required, and finally, make sure to have your questions in the Q&A box. Our team members are on hand to help you with any technical difficulties you may be experiencing. We will be putting the link to the French PowerPoint presentation in the chat if you would like to open it and follow along. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our guests for today. First, Disability Without Poverty's very own Rabia Adur, National Director, will be joining us to share a bit about the opportunity that we're all in at this moment. Then, Senator Brent Cotter will join us and walk us through how a bill is created, the various aspects of the process, and most importantly, where we can really ensure our voices lead the change. We'll then move into a panel discussion fueled by your questions with myself, Senator Cotter, and joined by Greg McMeekin, the newly appointed advocate for peers, persons with disabilities in Alberta. And with that, I'll pass it off to Rabia. Thank you very much, Michelle. Welcome everybody. First and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge the land that I, we, all of us joining uh, this afternoon call home. Turtle Island, home to our Indigenous First Nations and Métis peoples, the ancestors that we are eternally grateful to, who allowed us to remain in this land, to share in this land. Yes, we are the colonizers, a part of our colonial past, settler populations who have infringed on their traditional territories. We are committed to truth and reconciliation and justice for our indigenous peoples. And we recognize that they are indeed the, the original inhabitants and trustees of these lands that we call Canada as home. 
Disability Without Poverty. So I'm its national director talking to you from Mississauga, Ontario, the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the new credits most recently. Now, the DWP journey, the Disability Without Poverty journey began during the pandemic. There's a lot of work that's been done on disability poverty prior to, and certainly disability poverty has long since existed and gotten exacerbated during the pandemic. And as we recover today, we, with rising inflation and, and extraordinary costs of living for everybody, the brunt is being felt even more deeply by people with disabilities going into deeper and deeper poverty. So in 2020, September, in the throne speech, the Prime Minister announced a Canada disability benefit, a promise we felt was too big to leave just to government to bring forward. So we began mobilizing. We brought together such webinars to better inform people, to gather people, to engage in conversation, to build some capacity, Fast forward, we established a leadership team. I was brought on board as national director. Meanwhile, we had uh, a minister very committed to bringing forward the Canada Disability Benefit. We had the bill tabled in June 2021 and dissolved with that parliament because we were going into an election. Given the election, we encouraged everybody to get out and vote get to know the platforms, look at who's saying what about the Canada Disability Benefit, because we are not going to forget this promise. We wrote an open letter once the minority government was installed, signed by 200 prominent Canadians with and without disabilities. Due to its overwhelming response, we also launched a petition signed by 17,874 individuals in this country presented before Parliament uh, in February by Green Party MP Mike Maurice. In that journey, we continue to advocate with numerous op-eds published, media appearances, conversations like this, in talking to individuals, talking to politicians, talking to everybody about the Canada Disability Benefit, and disability poverty. Now, finally, we are, we, are, we are seeing some of the fruits of our labor and the labor of many, many others in this movement from coast to coast to coast in the form of that bill being reintroduced finally last week. Here we are, there is a bill in the House of Commons. And today we're gonna learn more about how that bill needs to become law, what happens in the process, and what can we do to make sure that it happens and it happens quickly. Disability Without Poverty is committed to where's the bill in Parliament now. It is in Parliament, but it is there is that big question of where is it every step of the way. And then we will begin our journey of benefit design and benefit Im implementation. We want this benefit delivered to Canadians with disabilities, people with disabilities living in Canada by the end of next year, as soon as possible. And we all need to work together in this journey. Today, we're really excited that we're gonna learn a lot more in depth and detail about how the Canada Disability Benefit Bill will indeed become law. So that's my quick overview of this journey. The participation of people is critical in the process. Every one of us has power to speak. We have called upon you to be writing letters with a click of a button to the prime minister, the ministers and other key MPs, including your own constituency MPs so that they know that this bill matters and needs to be fast-tracked. So now we'll continue that conversation. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, thank you very much, Rabia. 
And with that, I will now pass over to our first speaker, our main speaker, because we're following with a panel discussion, Senator Brent Cotter, who I am so delighted to be able to hear today, because I know when Rabia and I met him earlier this year, we had a complete education, and I, I look forward to him sharing his wisdom with you today. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Rabia, for welcoming me to this. Um, I will try to speak for about 20 minutes and not extend my talking beyond that so that the panel and qu your questions can get well considered in the time that we have. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask somebody to change the slides as we go. Um, it's beyond, there we go, that's perfect. What I would like to do is try to cover these eight or nine topics in the 20 minutes or so. And my first point, I think, is about what I would call laws and the rule of law. Generally speaking, all governments uh, have to be governed by the rule of law. And that means that, for example, taking a disability benefit as the best example for today, they cannot just invent it and start doing it. It needs to be done in a legal framework. That's how we kind of respect the laws of the land. And so that's why this is quite important. Um, maybe we could go to the next slide. Uh, I won't say too much more about this, but this highlights sort of some of the reasons why um, the idea of laws and the rule of law are important so that people can know what the law is, can trust it. If it's not good enough, they can move to make it better. Um, and also it's both transparent and people who are you know, paying their taxes can see how that money gets spent. Maybe we could go to the next slide, which begins to talk about what laws really are. If you think about the Canada Disability Benefit Bill that was introduced by Minister Qualtro last week in the House of Commons, that is actually the title of it when it finally becomes law is actually called, I'm going to read it out to you, the Canada Disability Benefit Act. This helps to explain where we will end up, which is that when what goes through the, the two houses of parliament, the House of Commons and the Senate, once it gets passed it, and becomes law, it is then called an act. And that's what we tend to call things like the Canada Health Act or the uh, uh, statutes and laws like that. The bill is the initial process that gets that, that started. And you can see what is set out on the screen here is it's a document that gets presented to one or other of the two houses of parliament, the House of Commons or the Senate. I sit in the Senate. And the law has to go through both processes, both houses of parliament to become the law. It, it usually starts in the House of Commons where the members of parliament are and where uh, ministers themselves sit. So Minister Qualtro brought, for example, the disability benefits bill to the House of Commons. It has to go through a process there and then go to the Senate. That process has a series of stages, and we will see those as we move to the next slide. This, the Disability Benefits Bill, fits into the category of government bills, which is one of the two types of bills, the initiating of a law, that can be presented. Sometimes individual members of parliament or even individual senators might start the process themselves if they, have, they think a very good idea. In reality, though, uh, it's important to know that private members' bills don't have very much of a, of a track record of success. It is usually one individual who starts the ball rolling there, whereas with the government bill, it has all kinds of other forms of momentum. And with the disability benefits bill, it has the, the momentum of the government, of commitments in an election campaign, and the, the communications and urging by thousands of Canadians that this is a good idea. It nearly always requires some thinking about what's a good policy to advance, which is what that bill would, would uh, qualify as. And then before it comes to where it's gotten today, 
or last week at least, it gets considered by the cabinet. You will all know this, I think, but the cabinet is made up of members of parliament who the prime minister, Mr. Trudeau, has asked to join him as a kind of an executive part of the government. And they tend to be the guiding forces in terms of the direction of the government and the implementation of its policy commitments. And that's what we're seeing with respect to that bill. Maybe we could go to the next slide. Taking uh, Minister Qualtro's bill as an example, you will see that there are a series of, of stages that that bill will have to go through initially in the House of Commons. The first is its presentation, which is first reading. Then second reading, which is where the debating about the wisdom of the bill begins. And it's at that place that uh, Minister Qualtro and other members of Parliament might choose to deliver speeches and debate the principles of the bill. That sometimes takes a short time, sometimes a long time, depends on the bill, and it depends on the viewpoints of the parliamentarians on that question. What normally will happen, and I think it is highly likely in this case, is that the House of Commons will say, in this process, we would like this bill to be examined in detail by one of the committees of the House of Commons. The, the structure of the House of Commons is that the members of Parliament not only sit in the House of Commons, but they also sit on various committees. And one of those committees, I'm not sure which one, will likely receive that, that bill, and then they begin to examine it. And you can see there the kind of things that get done there. Witnesses and experts, likely some of you would be invited to the committee to explain your perspective on the bill, its importance, sometimes its shortcomings. And you would be questioned by members of, the, of the, that committee, members of parliament who sit on that committee. After that has taken place over sometimes a short time, sometimes a long time, meaning weeks or even months, the, the committee then moves forward to say what it thinks of the bill. And that might mean that they propose, suggest amendments to the bill to make it better or sometimes to thin it out because maybe the committee thinks it's too strong of a bill, for example. But usually, from their point of view, what will make it better? Uh, and then they bring that back to the House of Commons. Each committee reports back to the House of Commons to say what it thinks of the bill. And it usually has examined every kind of paragraph of the bill, what is called clause by clause, and say what they think yes or no, or maybe a change to each of those clauses. It then comes back to, to, to the um, House of Commons, and the House of Commons then examines the bill. They will have further debate, uh, whether they agree with what is, what is now the shape of the bill, and ultimately they will vote. And when they vote at what's called third reading, that will produce the sign-off by the House of Commons, by the first of the Houses of Parliament. Assuming that the bill is passed by the House of Commons, it then is sent over to the Senate. The Senate receives it. We are a crowd of people, just went a little bit too fast on that slide. We are a crowd of people in the Senate who will follow a very similar process. First, second, third reading in the middle there, probably examination by a committee, maybe the social committee of the Senate. And ultimately then uh, we would have a chance to vote on it. In the event that we would also vote yes, then it goes over to the Governor General to give her stamp of approval, which is called Royal Assent. And once that is in place, then the bill is, has been adopted. That's not fully the final story, though, because you can see at the bottom of this slide, there is something called coming into force. Often bills have some built-in uh, mechanism that will trigger when they come into existence. In the case of the disability benefits bill, one part of it says this act, that is the disability benefits act as it would come to be called, comes into force on a day fixed by order of the governor in council. And what that means is that it becomes the law and operational on the day that the governor in council, which is another phrase for the cabinet, decides that it kicks in and really becomes uh, active and actionable. Now, the next couple of slides will give you a little bit of the context about why there might be quite a bit more work before we can actually turn the switch and make the bill work. And to some extent, Rabia already referred to this. 
The story really around laws of the government of Canada or of the provinces is that there is the law or statute or act, the Disability Benefits Act, but the, the devil is often in the details. Who will qualify? How much will be the benefit? Uh, what might be the basis upon which you stop being qualified? And it is hard for governments to do all of that in the bill itself. So what they do is they delegate a power to create those sort of slightly lower level laws, which are called regulations. And this bill will then actually get life breathed into it by what the regulations have to say. So in fact, if you were to look at the bill itself, identical to the one from last year, there are two full pages of the powers given essentially to the cabinet, though the work will likely be done by the minister's office, to create the rules for the disability benefit. Two full pages and over 20 topics for these regulations. Who will be eligible? What will be the conditions you have to meet in order to be eligible? How much will the benefit be for? How, whether the benefit will be indexed to inflation? How to go about applying for the benefit? how it will be paid. Can you appeal if you didn't get treated fairly in the process? You can see a lot of things that have to be constructed. Lots of good ideas already worked up on this topic, but that's what the regulations will do. They will put the rules in place for that. And there is a two-stage process, as you can see on the screen, for the construction of the regulations. Um, my colleague, Jonathan, used as an example an iceberg to describe the relationship between the bill and then the regulations. The bill is often at the top, but it is often very much smaller than the regulations. When I used to teach in this area, I used to bring what were called the statutes or the bills and show them in a binder and then show you the regulations related to those. And the binders, the regulations were about eight times as large might even be more now. So it gives you an idea of where the meat is. Another feature of this and why this is so important is that the regulations have to stay uh, kind of inside the lines. The regulations have to color inside the lines of the bill. You could think about it like this. If the bill is a, um, is a piece of property that you acquired, and the house and the rooms inside it are where the regulations are, all the details. And you said to yourself, you know, what I would really like is um, a family room, but I would like it bigger than we were planning. And so I would like it to extend beyond the property line of the, the house that we bought or the property that we bought. That's offside, that's coloring outside the lines. So the rules have to be constructed, these regulations, inside what the statute itself allows and not go beyond the property line. Otherwise you get in trouble. Otherwise it's actually in the lingo of administrative law, kind of contrary to law. Coming back then to these regulations, they will be put together with consultation, I'm sure in the context that of, of the disability benefits bill. Uh, draft regulations are prepared in relation to these 20 plus topics. Uh, they get published feedback, comments received. Ultimately, the final version is adopted. It is adopted, though, by the cabinet and not by parliament. Sometimes parliament has a look at the regulations, but the cabinet, and largely under the control of the minister, ultimately authorizes the regulations to be blessed and kicked in. And once they're published, they become part of the legal package. And when those regulations are ready, it is likely that that would be when the bill would be a given operational effectiveness that is um, coming into force. So the regulations, the, the, the meat of the story of the disability benefits bill will, will be found in how those regulations get written and what they ultimately say. That's important, I think extremely important for the last couple of sets of observations I'll make, maybe beginning with the next slide. Because one of the things that um, is important is to think about ways in which one can influence not just the bill itself, but also the content of those regulations. 
And here, as you can see at the bottom, if you're attempting to change, or in this case, shape a regulation, dealing with what's called the regulatory agency, that is the ministry and the minister is way more important than dealing with 344 members of parliament because the minister and her staff in consultation with others will be the ones that will be creating the regulations, the meat of what is most important for the disability community, I think. Let's go to the next page and I'm nearly done, you'll be pleased to know. How can you have the greatest impact? The answer is in general terms at every stage of the process. With respect to the work that um, Disability Without Poverty and many other disability uh, advocacy groups have done, the early part of that work I think has already been done. This has been raised to a, a high point on the agenda for the government, which is good. It's not the highest, I don't think, so one needs to be relentless in advancing those uh, the arguments for why this is critical uh, in terms of achieving equity in our society and all of the arguments that, that I know, but you know much better than me. It's also important to kind of stay the course because it, it will help to move the bill along at a more rapid rate. That is, people will give it more priority. They'll take it seriously. And also for you to be communicating the messages about what that those regulations, what the rules of the game need to look like in order for this to be a fair and effective response to a significant need in our society. Maybe one last slide here. So you can see here, get in early, get in often. You've done that on the early basis, but it's important for you to be, keep communicating the messages in very precise terms now about what you need those regulations to say. And I think also, I suggest here, becoming the experts is good. A lot of the parliamentarians uh, and even sometimes in departments will not be as knowledgeable on the subject matter that you know well. You have lived with both the challenge and now the opportunity here for a much longer time than people in parliament or in the Senate ever have. So providing and sharing your expertise to help those decision makers becomes really critical. And speaking for somebody who has a modest degree of knowledge on this topic um, and a high degree of commitment, but as I say, my knowledge is more modest, the way in which you can help me and colleagues like me will uh, benefit us, but also in the, in the long run, achieve the goals that are the most important to you. So I should probably stop there. I think I probably I, I used to be a law professor and I'm tend, I tend to go on way past my time. So let me stop there and, uh, and turn, it, uh, turn it back to Michelle and our dialogue and the panel and the questions. I hope that's somewhat helpful for you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Senator Carter. So much information, um, so important for us um, all to learn. And I know I've seen questions from people asking if this is being recorded, if the slides will be available, and yes is the answer to both of those. So you can reach out in the chat to our support and uh, they will deal with any questions to do with access to the slides. And I know we will be uh, widely publicizing once the recording is available so everybody can follow up. So um, I have the position now of both being on the panel and being maybe answering some questions as well. So if I do this well, maybe I don't get to answer anything and I just get to send the questions out to uh, Senator Carter and, and to Greg, but no, we're, we're all here. So I want to start off with something though that is going to you, Senator Carter. And just so everybody knows, um, these aren't, these aren't my questions, right? These, I'm not just making these up. These are the questions that people have been sending in, questions that we brainstormed before now. And so if you still have questions, please go to that Q&A box and type in your question. And if, if we can get to them, we will. There are a team that are, uh, are sending those questions through to me in chat so that, that I, can, I can say it to you. So, my, so the first question that we, we hear from a lot of people, obviously, you, you know, you explained that this is a law, that a bill that is being passed that is, does not have those, um, those details that we were, we're, we're all desperate to hear about when, who and how much. So why is it then that when it comes to something like CERB, 
that part that got through really quickly and money got into people's pockets quickly but something like this which is um, a, a benefit for disabled people why does it take so long so uh, that's for you senator copter i thought it might be um it's uh, in those respects it's unpredictable the various forces that move something along quickly if if we were to talk a little bit about serb i would say that every member of parliament um, had a sense that there was an urgent threat to the whole economy and so whether they were thinking about people with disabilities or they were thinking about some truck driver who was laid off or, or the corner store really struggling to make ends meet, there was a sudden and comprehensive sense of urgency there, I think. So that even um, senators and parliamentarians who might sometimes oppose a government as an opposition, um, they, they felt the urgency and the willingness to spend money. Um, if, if, a, if a sense of urgency can be created, and also a sense that this is an intelligent investment, not just in people's lives, which is extremely important, but also in, in benefiting others, even beyond the beneficiaries of the, of the disability benefit. That raises the level of urgency and acceptability and uh, moderates the amount of resistance that might be out there. So uh, there are some, you identified CERB as a very good example that moved quickly, but there was a, a, even a, a simple one of not very much money, a firefighter's tax exemption, sat around for five or five and a half years. So uh, the, the ideal here is, I think it's unlikely that we will move this as quickly as CERB, but we have to do it a lot faster than the firefighter one. Uh, and so making right. the case for the urgency and the value particularly to people with disabilities and how that produces fairness and equity in our society, but also enriches the whole society, I think helps to make the case so that you get larger buy-in and that moves it quicker. So thank you. So that buy-in piece that you talked to on one of your slides about us uh, getting in early and often and staying the course, Greg, I want to make sure that, you know, I, I include you. Most of the questions are coming and not for you or for either for Senator Carter. But um, how do you feel um, we need to uh, we need to communicate that urgency in the best possible way that we can? Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And thank you to Senator Carter for that wonderful presentation. Um, that was very insightful. Uh, to me, it's all about urgency and how we create urgency. And the, the best message I can provide to all of you right now is keep communicating, keep talking. Like was said in the introduction, keep connecting with your uh, with your members of parliament, with your members of legislative assemblies in the various jurisdictions. The more we talk, the more urgency is created. Um, as Senator Carter alluded to, um, the more we talk, the faster it moves and the more urgency up the ladder goes. You'll know, uh, Senator Carter's presentation noted quite an um, extensive pro process in getting a bill passed. Really, when we look at disability poverty, we can't wait that long. People need support and they need support now. So it's incumbent uh, on all of us it's a joint effort to move these things as long as, as fast as possible can. Uh, thanks. No, thanks very much, Greg. I should say that both uh, Senator Carter and uh, Greg have a, uh, a background with, um, in law and I don't. So all of the law questions are going their way and, and uh, I, will, I, will, I will deal with the uh, with other pieces. So here's something that is cure. I think this is a, um, this is a, a 
for those of us who are perhaps going through this process in this detail for the first time, um, could you give us a sense, Senator Carter, perhaps of how many bills are introduced but never make it to getting passed? You know, um, you know, just so that we have a sense of is this something that, as you say, the firefighters five years, is this something, you know, it's not, is this a, about speed or is it like things that fail as well? You mentioned, I know you mentioned private members bills, right. but aside from I, that. Private members bills are probably running at under 10% of success rate. Um, government legislation um, might get amended at different places in the process, but government bills have a much higher um, uh, success rate. Uh, they and and I would say that in the context that we're in right now, with a fairly uh, with with the liberals and the New Democrats entering into a kind of um, uh, an agreement to try to sustain the government as a minority government for a longer period of time, the runway is a little bit longer. So what that tends to mean is that even if the bill doesn't get passed immediately. It's still alive. We don't face the problem that we experienced last June when Parliament was prorogued and everything that was on the table got erased from the table. You will have followed what happened to last year's disability benefits bill. So that there's a, a much better chance of um, this being sustained. It's also um, a, a good in the sense that it is identified as both one of the government's political priorities and part of the message in the mandate letter to the to Minister Qualtro. So those kind of raise the the prospects, I would say. I can't, uh, the, the, the world, I'm relatively new in the Senate. I've been there two and a half years. I'm not particularly political and I'm not very good at predicting politics, but uh, this looks to me like the best chance um, for a fairly prompt consideration of this law uh, fairly quickly. The one um, challenge, I think, is the question of cost. And there will be some uh, members of parliament and some senators who will say, how expensive will this be uh, for, for the Canadian budget, for example? Um, I think as much precision as you can help provide to decision makers on that would be helpful. And sometimes the answer is, the cost of not doing it is actually greater than the cost of doing it. And being able to articulate that in a, in a meaningful, powerful way will be beneficial to many of, of my colleagues. Um, and and so I'm, I'm more hopeful, I would say, than I was last year and probably more hopeful than when I began these conversations with some of your colleagues uh, even before that. Thank Can you. I, that's, that's really... Okay. I was just going to add, I, I saw one person ask the question, why did it take a year for this to make its way back onto the agenda? Um, six months of that was lost by prorogation and, and uh, getting things up and running, you know, last November, December, which is a typical problem. Um, um, who sets the priorities for as things start to come forward? There are probably uh, maybe 10 or 15 um, government bills that have made their way into the process. It's one of those. It wasn't the first one that was delivered, but it was one of them. And, but that's usually a sign that it's relatively important to the government. So that's, even though the time frame seems to have been a long wait for it to come back, I'd say that's still encouraging that it's here now. Yeah, I think the last um, month in particular has been uh, extremely frustrating because it seemed it just seemed like everybody agreed yes we should table it and then it was never actually happening so it uh, you know as we all know when you're not actually there inside the room hearing the conversations yeah. and it's yeah so I actually have a couple of questions to go to Greg with and that uh, perhaps uh, you know Senator Carter and I could uh, add to um, as, as well so the first one, Greg, uh, given that your you know your ties to the um, Al Alberta legislature and so on, how can we make sure this benefit will not end up clawing back provincial disability benefits, meaning that it won't take away the financial support or the programs and services that are delivered in each? What would your advice be so that um, that we can make the most appropriate? approaches in each province to ensure that. 
The short answer is keep advocating, really. That's what it comes down to. Uh, 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 keep communicating with, with members of par parliament or the legislature uh, with my office. Um, uh, let your voices be heard. Um, we, um, this is a uh, clawback, sir. Uh, certainly no stranger to what we uh, face in Alberta and we have to look at the whole we have to look at this issue holistically um, we're trying to end poverty poverty here we're trying to help people support themselves so there shouldn't be clawbacks um, uh, there shouldn't be a dollar for dollar takeaway. Uh, people need the support and, and that's all there is to it. Thanks, Greg. And I think what's important as well is that we can put a lot, you know, obviously a lot of work will go into setting this up at the beginning, um, but we need to ensure that there are watchdogs within the disability community, but also within various levels of government to make sure that things don't start to creep in. Because sometimes, right. you know, it's easy to have those robust systems at the start of something, but, you know, after five years, the bus pass goes and nobody really, you know, made the set that amount of fuss that they would have made if $50 was taken away or something or whatever those programs and services might be. So I think the clawback part isn't just important for now it's an ongoing consideration as well um, right. and, so what and, and i was just going to add that all the way along people with disabilities need to be involved in that process absolutely so um i don't know if you know this greg because i certainly don't know the answer how many provinces actually have a disability advocate because, you know, we, we're, we don't particularly have, we don't, did we just get one or we don't have one in BC? My memory is playing tricks on me today. But so, um, do, do most provinces have somebody like your, your office? No, no, I, um, forgive me, I don't have the number in front of me, but I, I would say very few. So if people aren't reaching out if they don't if they don't have an office of a disability advocate like yours in their province who would you suggest they reach out to in their provinces um the, the government the, the ministries the ministries of community and social services um, yeah, social development uh, poverty social reduction. development also the new um um also our federal counterparts, the uh, new um, accessibility commissioner uh, reached out to his office. Uh, have him connect with, with the various jurisdictions. Um, yeah, just, I, and I, I, I agree. And, you'll, yeah. and I, I, think, I think for me, it's important as we approach the summer, we know that politicians like nothing more than to go out to, well, as where I live, like country fairs or those sorts of events that go on and meet people and shake their hands. And there's no better time than to go up to your local politicians, municipal, you know, um, provincial, federal, shake their hands, introduce yourself and say, hey, I need your support on this. Let me talk to you about this Canada disability benefit. And if they say, you know, they don't have enough time, how can I get back in touch with you? When will you have time to listen to me? And you tell them your story and you tell them your concerns because that's what people are there to do, right? That's that's what our systems are for. So uh, I'm, I'm going to go, go, Greg. Sorry, I was just going to say two quick things. Uh, make sure they make time for you. Don't Absolutely. don't take no for an answer. And the second thing I would suggest, put it in writing. Get it in writing because 
They can't ignore paper. Thank you, Greg. So I have a question for Senator Carter. So we've talked about a law that then, um, you know, and as we know, this bill that becoming a law is a framework and the same language as last year, and it's pretty sparse, right? It's not, and, you know, for the disability community, it really doesn't have the details that people right. want to know, like how, who, when. And as we've said, those come in the regulations. And as you mentioned, those regulations are run by the minister's office. So I understand the process of the bill going through the House and the Senate and the committee time and, and that that's you know, a good time for people. There's a process to maybe be a witness to a committee or send in a written report. What happens, and you, I, I, I think there was that thing, thing about Canada Gazette 1 and Canada De Gazette yeah. 2, which all seems very technical. How do, what do people do? What's the process? Because that's going to be where the rubber hits the road, where the things that people are really concerned about. When we get to that place, how do people have input then? When it Usually, and I think in a case like this, it will be reasonably well publicized what the draft regulations will look like. Um, they would show up in that Canada Gazette, but they would be made, I think, widely available. And that would enable uh, each of you and uh, disability advocacy organizations to communicate whether these are adequate, whether these are, are, are uh, have overlooked some things, whether they are allowing the kind of provincial clawbacks that would be problematic. Um, so the key is to, to watch for that. But rather than just watching for that, trying to have input in what the, the regulations should themselves look like. Now, you, you're, you're probably not... Uh, um, don't have a, a talent pool of people who write regulations, uh, but there are, are lots of people who are able to give good advice on these questions. The, the, the writing of them tends to be fairly technical. It's people who, who draft these kinds of things for a living for governments, but the, the subject matter of how they should work and the key points are e easily able to be advanced. And I wouldn't wait until you know, uh, how, however much good faith uh, Minister Qualtro will bring to this, I would say be proactive rather than reactive and in terms of waiting. Uh, but it's also uh, useful to keep in mind where you can be effective in that regulation process and where you can't. For example, one person asks, um, will this be available to seniors with disabilities? And you might say, well, we'll invest a bunch of energy on that. That would, uh, I don't want to be disrespectful to seniors with disabilities, but that would be a mistake because this bill has, it makes it clear that they're focusing on, focusing on working age Canadians, people 18 to 65. So if, if you're, uh, if you're, if you think that's inappropriate, then you need the law itself, the bill itself to be different. I don't think that will happen, but you, you won't get anywhere trying to get the regulations to make money available for seniors because that's kind of like building the dining room that's across into the next person's lot. It's sort of out of bounds. So that won't, that won't, uh, uh, that won't happen. So knowing and the parts that you can work on and the parts that you can't at the different stages is, is I think really important. And I saw another question that asked, um, so if the amount is insufficient, will you, you know, or the senators send it back? But, but you don't get an input on that, right? That's why, because it's in the regulations. That's not the process. Your process is to get it to a law. Am I correct? That's right. Or, That's right. We, we okay. will not, when we vote in favor of this, as you described it rightly, Michelle, a framework bill, we won't know what those numbers are. There are committees of the House of Commons and the Senate that, that review regulations, sort of more generally, but that's a mighty big task if I'm describing to you how many there are. Um, so we would be able to be attentive to that, uh, but we won't know in advance. We might have the minister come and say, how much are you going to make available here? Uh, but she probably won't be in a position to commit on that. It also explains, uh, as one other person posed the question, why is there nothing in the present federal budget for, for the disability benefit? And the answer is because they haven't quite figured out yet or been ready to make public, and they're not going to make that money available this year. And the budget is really for this 
fiscal year right now. So um, as hopeful as you and I might be that this will come together expeditiously, we're really talking about money that would become available beginning next year, I hope, but it won't be available this year. Um, we have to we have to put the package together, partly by the parliamentarians examining and passing the bill, and then the minister and her team putting together the how this will roll out in, in real life terms, in terms of amounts, who's qualified, how you qualify, that kind of thing. Thank you. And, and I think, you know, your analogy about, uh, you know, not colouring out outside the lines, how, you know, no, no matter how much, uh, you know, you want to build that room, that addition elsewhere. I think that's really important to how effective we can be as a community to know when and where and to who that we actually make make those things. And I think, Greg, I think you made that point clearly. And that's what's really come across to me um, from you, Senator Cotter. And we are running out of time. And so thank you. And it's my, my time to just... Uh, close some of this out for us. So uh, now that we've covered the basics of a bill, we need your help to get the Canada Disability Benefit into the pockets of disabled people living in Canada. We need to do what we can to put pressure on our MPs to take action before they break for the summer on June 23rd. Poverty and inflation do not take a rest. Ending disability poverty is an act of justice that you can take part in. We've added a link to this slide and we'll also put this information in the chat so that you can easily access Disability Without Poverty's webpage that has all the tools you will need to easily access your MP. You can customize your message and, set, and a sample text for your email and subject line are provided just in case you need ideas on what to say. Please call or email your MP today and tell them to fast track the Canada Disability Benefit without delay. And finally, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Senator Carter. Thank you, Greg. Greg, sorry, I'm so sorry. Greg, my mouth isn't working too well today. And to all of the host of people in the background that have made this incredible webinar possible. The work that we all do wouldn't be possible without the support of disabled people like you that are here attending. And we're so grateful for each and every one of you taking the time to learn more and to get involved. We would love for you to keep in touch. On screen and in the chat, we will be putting helpful links for you to contact us. We have had so many questions and comments and there was no way we would ever go to get to all of them in the time. However, we do take them all away and we do at Disability Without Poverty use them to pose them to the people that we come across, like when we meet Senator Cutter in his office in his official capacity to ask them about these things. The easiest place to go to stay involved is disabilitywithoutpoverty.ca. Thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.